The Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre is a unique blend of industry, government and research partners who come together delivering applied research for Australian industry. Recent severe weather events have highlighted the importance of the preparation and disaster response activities that will mitigate the impact of such events on the logistic and transport network. In order to better understand the key challenges here, the research team undertook a series of major workshops in Townsville, Broome and Grafton, in which the perspectives of the local community were captured and discussed. The key findings from these workshops will be highlighted in this video, together with those from the two more detailed investigations into key areas of concern. Climate change is very likely to have serious impacts on Australia's economy and its communities. One of these impacts is going to come from a greater number and more severe natural disasters. We'll be looking at more cyclones, storm surges, floods and bushfires. The costs from natural disasters around the world are escalating rapidly. The five largest megastorms in the US over the recent decade created damages in the order of $300 billion. State agencies around Australia are now looking very seriously about how to increase the resilience of road and transport networks, not only to reduce the cost of rebuilding, but also to ensure the provision of services and safety to communities during these disasters. Natural disasters um, have a huge impact on in main roads and in Western Australia, causing severe damage to our roads and other transport infrastructure, particularly around the north of the state. The really important of this research is about making our state more resilient, bringing some learnings in for us at main roads um, to, to, to make more resilient roads, build better roads for the future, you know, reducing, I think, the impacts on the state and, and the budgets that we use to, to maintain the roads. There's a big economic imperative, but it's also about resilience of our whole network, you know, moving um, freight around, you know, logistics, getting goods into places. We've got a, a lot of remote communities and uh, you know, the better we can be at servicing those, it's going to really enhance the state for the future. The workshops were incredible resources to provide us with on-the-ground understanding about the implementation of strategies to increase the resilience of road and transport networks. Once we identified a vision which was effectively to get communities up and running really quickly was to think about what were some of the things in place that would disable that vision, some of the barriers that would make it difficult to achieve that vision and some of the enablers, some of the things that are already in place, some of the communication networks, some of the, some of the support networks that were already in place that could then be harnessed to achieve that vision. From this, the teams then decided on specific areas where a particular barrier might be able to be overcome or a particular enabler or supporting mechanism might be able to be harnessed to deliver real outcomes to enhancing the resilience of the road and transport network. As a result of these conversations, seven key themes, seven really exciting themes have come out of the workshops. A key factor in the readiness, response and recovery to natural disasters is a well-prepared and informed community with strong social structures in place. Cyclone Sunday began about 15 years ago and it's really about preparing our community for the wet season events that we have here in the north. Prepare them for cyclones and for flooding events. And the main reason we do that is because we're trying to build that resilience in the city. Well we plan for the the ultimate worst event which is a um, category 5 storm tide event. So we've actually planned, done desktop planning on that. We need the community to be prepared. We know that roads will be cut off for a period of time, that our airport may not be usable for up to seven days. And it's our role to ensure that we've worked and planned with emergency services on how we will deal with disaster events. Not just cyclones, not just floods, but really literally every type of disaster event imaginable. We've worked very hard, particularly with Indigenous and Islander communities as well, to ensure that they understand their responsibility, and as well as our migrant and refugee community. These are people who have come from places that have never seen cyclones before. It's been important for us to be able to engage with them so they understand that they have a role to play. Part of our role is to constantly look and see what other communities are doing whether they're communities in Australia or communities around the world. Now obviously through the university system we have better access to data and research and that's important for anyone when they're having to to make a decision about how, we, how we're going to do things in the future. 
And I mean, we just have to see what happened with, with Hurricane Katrina. I don't want to make the same mistakes they made in those events. And the best way to avoid that is to go back and look at the research. That's why it's important to partner up. Questions are now being raised around how much should be invested to increase the strength and capacity post-event. So if we have a, a road blowout such as this, you can see some new infrastructure that's been put in place. Should we be strengthening bridges? Should we be replacing bridges? All of this requires capital investment, but however, in the long term, if it leads to reduced costs from natural disasters, it could be a, a, a wise investment. There are a variety of activities that can be utilised and I think it will be very useful to consider um, a disaster management resilience asset management framework to do that and that encompasses things like identifying what are the areas prone for natural disasters now and in the future, identifying also the assets that operate within those uh, areas in terms of our roads for example and their critical components and also getting a better understanding of the costs to the agency but also the cost to the wider community and business communities. Those costs need to be, costs needs to be identified over the whole life cycle of the asset because regularly every year it is expected that some of those vulnerable assets will uh, result in loss of their functionality. I welcome this research and I look forward to with confidence uh, to actually further expand this research that will give us better understanding and knowledge of how to actually make our roads more resilient. The concept of disaster repurposing, where we can start looking at, you know, obviously looking at school ovals as recovery centres and we're putting um, operation centres in libraries, these sorts of things are, are done and done really effectively. But thinking more out of the box, we can start looking at sections of main roads that may be replacements for airstrips if, if the airport's interrupted, um, and where we can start to park freight, start to, start to park caches of supplies and use that road network as part of the response rather than something that's interrupted and then quickly restored. In terms of transport network resilience, uh, the road infrastructure is often vital in times of natural disaster. The road may be cut temporarily by floodwaters or due to bushfire, but once the waters recede or the bushfire abates, then the road network, particularly the principal road network, is there for those emergency services to respond. Uh, recently in uh, New South Wales, we uh, constructed a new section of the Silver City Highway, some several hundred kilometres uh, north of Broken Hill. It was identified in conjunction with the local community that the widening or the reconstruction uh, could incorporate an airstrip and that has been constructed and is now available for use uh, in any emergency situation. We're certainly pleased with, this, uh, with the outcome of this study which provides us with a number of directions for, uh, for further investigation. A key theme of the outcomes of the workshops was looking at the preparedness at a whole of community level and even a whole of state level. Now we have access to sophisticated digital scenario and digital monitoring um, software that for example we can look at the flow of commodities or the access to say fuels or to food and when the network, the transport network system is disrupted how we can quickly provide access to these resources and get the commodities flowing quickly. Our approach was to create a tool that would allow us to look at system vulnerability for commodity flows in and out of regions. We've taken the road network for the whole of the state of Queensland and we've been able to identify locations that are vulnerable for particular commodity flows to be able to get them in and out of key regions. The first commodity we've looked at is petroleum. Our approach was to look at every single petrol station, every petroleum supply depot, to marry that with the transport networks and to look at vehicle registration data in key regions to see what the likely demands were, how supply would work, and to see when we saw flood risk where communities would be affected. So that meant we had a pretty realistic picture of where and when communities would be affected in terms of lack of access to petroleum products. The key advantages for a transport agency are understanding where the vulnerabilities are. And you can then test and simulate what might be the best ways to reduce those vulnerabilities. Where we'd like to go next is to look at other commodities. We'd like to look at food coming into affected regions, and we'd like to look at perishable agricultural produce 
coming out. Because we know when roads, bridges uh, are cut, uh, if farmers can't get their product to market, uh, it can ruin their livelihood for that year. Local communities and you know, local councils are well supported by state and federal agencies. However, sometimes the processes to, to unlock that support can be a little convoluted or, or have some blockages that are unnecessary. So a key theme of the workshops is to identify how this process can be streamlined so the support can be provided quickly to where it's needed and communities can be well supported. It is critically important that good, strong governance structures are in place to ensure the provision of support during and after natural disasters occur. Well documented plans and good working relationships help communities recover and get on their feet faster and helps build more resilience after events such as natural disasters occur. So modern technologies now provide an amazing resource to disaster recovery. Imagine having the option of being able to put up a drone to survey an area hours and hours before you could get a full drive into that area. And imagine the opportunity of having tilt sensors on stoby poles or on trees and having the, the central control area, having on a screen, start to see which of the poles have fallen over, which trees have fallen over. Many of us now are very used to using a smartphone to access information from all over the world in real time. And there is a massive opportunity in disaster recovery to, to do the same things. As you can imagine, responding to some of the natural disasters at the scale that we have in Australia is an immense task and it involves a number of actors and agencies communicating with each other, sharing knowledge and supporting each other. Um, so any way to improve this process, to improve this coordination, to improve information, to flow between them, it's going to be, have, a, have a real impact on communities and on getting things moving quickly on road networks. In this project, we have uh, created a model that includes a number of uh, stakeholders that basically responds to disaster events. That includes road agencies, the city council, the transport working group, the local disaster management group, as well as the fire and emergency services. What we did is basically looked at the key functions that each stakeholder uh, perform during uh, a disaster event, and we looked at the input and the output they produce with a view to uh, provide a realistic model of how those functions interact with each other and how to uh, improve their overall efficiency. The exciting outcome of this project is that we now have a framework for, for a basis of action where we can take action that will involve stakeholders in these cities and towns and provide state governments and national governments with a clear mandate and a clear understanding of how to streamline their efforts, much of which is already underway and this framework provides a way to bring it together and link it to the people working on the ground in these cities, which for me is a really exciting outcome.